Orgasmic Enlightenment, where the sexual and spiritual come together. I'm Kim Anami, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach and a vaginal weightlifter. In this show, we explore all things intimate. I believe that our sexual energy is life force, creative energy, and we can use it to shape our worlds, strengthen our relationships, and self-actualize. I blend the most avant-garde information from neuroscience, ancient sexual practices like Tantra and Taoism, to renegade wellness modalities to show you how to create gourmet sex in your lives. Come one, come all. Superpower couple. What is a power couple? When we think of a couple who evokes this term, what are the characteristics they possess? For me, this would mean a couple who is solidly unified, they've merged personally and maybe professionally in some way, or at least both of them have solid accomplishments, and they've both learned and appear to be empowered, as in they have direction and control of their lives. So let's go further than that. What is an Anami power couple? (laughs) First off, the word Anami means limitless. In Sanskrit, this is the highest level you can go, but beyond that in terms of the heavens, as far as you can go in your development, your enlightenment, except that you keep going and growing infinitely. There isn't a limit to that. So an Anami power couple is all of the above and more. The big difference between them and let's say your average power couple is that they are consciously utilizing the power of their sexual connection and channeling that energy out into the world. So this is more accurate to call them a super power couple. This is the kind of couple who you can tell are very in sync. They often complete each other's thoughts or sentences naturally, and you can see and feel the palpable buzz of their sexual energy around them because they now have access to this ease and grace and energy that extends to all parts of their lives, from their health to their careers. So what are the traits of the superpower couple? Well, basically they're geniuses, ha ha ha. I mean, this lightly, but I kind of don't because I often talk about how harnessing your sexual energy makes you a creative genius because you're tapping into source power and now you're using it in your life. By doing this and then doing it with a partner, you launch the creative power of the universe and then through your love, your conscious attention and the direction of that desire, you're able to create and recreate your universe anew. Think about it. Why do you think sex has been so heavily censored and distorted over the past millennia? Not because it's bad, because it's dirty, because it's a massive tool of awakening when used in a conscious and elevated way. If you are interested in controlling the masses and keeping them asleep and unquestioning, one of the most pivotal things you would do would be to separate them from this natural innate power that every single person has access to. You would distort the narrative and lie about what this thing can actually do. And because unused and disowned, this power inverts on itself, then you have a population with the life force choked out of it. They become submissive and, well, kind of stupid. And I've said before that one of the biggest problems with being underfucked is that it makes you stupid. You're blind and you're deaf and you're dumb to your own power and the reality of what is actually happening in and around you and your own power to shape these circumstances. So before we meet Chris and Lauren, who are our well-fucked all-star couple for this episode, here are four main principles and tools I would say are essential to cultivate superpower couple status. Principle number one, a mutual agreement that the relationship exists as a container for growth. We could call this conscious coupling. And this is something that people rarely do. Most people fall into their relationships. They have no idea how to create them. They are drawn in by their unconscious patterns and triggers which are seeking resolution and they fumble their way through. 
all of the people I know who I would consider to be sexual or relationship savants have put in the time. Usually through pain, they've pushed themselves to learn more and understand their own behavior and how they can make these things work well. They've taken responsibility for their healing and their learning. And this means that like any other facet of their lives, exercise, health, nutrition, career, they understand that their relationship needs constant tending to thrive. This means that when we are triggered or we see things about the other person that we don't like or about ourselves, we don't run, we don't hide, we don't avoid, we face them. We know that issues will come up and this is okay. This is supposed to happen. This is even welcomed because we use these as opportunities to heal our unhealed parts, our blind spots, our weaknesses, and out of that, we create strength. We zero right in on whatever is going on and we look at it together. Principle number two, we will expose ourselves from our hearts to our genitals. We will uncover and I will let you in. The most challenging and rewarding thing about getting close to someone is well, getting close to them. We drop our guards, we part our legs, we dare to believe we will be loved and loved well and that we are worthy of such love. This is all about surrender. Surrender is the price of admission. Living with walls between you is exhausting and this will take its toll in everything from the quality of your relationship to your dead sex life, to your health, to your finances. The price of living in a state of defensiveness is a slow or rapid death. If you listened to my Quantum Love and Healing podcast with Bruce Lipton a couple of weeks back, you'll remember that we talked about growth versus protection. And there's this microcosm of a cell. A cell cannot be in both simultaneously. And this is one of my favorite micro macro metaphors ever. So when you are in defense mode, you don't grow. And you would be surprised by how many people have defense and lockdown as their permanent states. You can buy into the narrative that going into lockdown is the way to solve a problem, or you can rewrite the narrative with the idea and fact that placing yourself in a vibration of love and openness is what transcends everything. And I mean everything. It builds your immunity to everything from pathogens to societal programming because you're now just so far beyond it all. You have transcended these silly human detours and traps. Principle number three, we will fuck a lot and fucking is important. Osho used to say something like, you can fuck all your problems away and to an extent, he's right. Fucking with no talking won't work and talking with no fucking won't work, but the fucking can often resolve a lot of issues wordlessly and the deep talking can and usually does lead to cataclysmic fucking. So this is all about the prioritization of sex. Even if you think you have no time, and your kids are around and you have this and you have that, I do not buy your excuses. Get up half an hour earlier in the morning and have a 30 minute sex date. Buy a trailer and put it in your backyard for mommy and daddy private time. When the going gets rough, the sex gets rougher. Ha ha ha. I mean, <laughs> that the sex is what will save you and give you the brain power, creativity, and physical energy, as well as this superpower couple quality that I speak of. If you haven't already, check out the past couple of weeks episodes of the podcast, Sex, Intimacy, and Immunity, and then I already mentioned the Quantum Love and Healing episode with Dr. Bruce Lipton. I am 100% right on these things because science Principle number four, I will tell you the truth, and yes, the truth shall set us both free. Radical honesty and open communication are integral to this kind of relationship. Your bullshit will get you nowhere. <laughs> it always amazes me with people who lie and think that they're getting away with it. Oh, you're so crafty, because everyone knows everything. In the ethers, in the collective unconscious, even if they aren't fully aware of how or why or what they know, they still know. And so every lie that you tell, every sin of omission you perpetuate is coloring itself upon the tapestry of your connection and you are deadening that connection. 
The truth is essential in these kinds of relationships. It's like Anais Nin says, most relationships don't die from major blows, they die from a thousand tiny little nicks and hacks. If you want the kind of relationship where the sex eventually fizzles out and you and your partner lead separate lives and have separate bedrooms, by all means, tell white lies and full on lies all day long or on some days or whatever. But you can reverse that entropy with honesty. That is the key to taking the relationship from the unconscious into the realm of conscious where you transcend all. All right, in today's episode, we have a well-fucked all-star couple, a superpower couple, Lauren and Chris, and through chatting with them, you'll get a sense of these things in action, all of these principles that they've applied to their lives and how they have reached this legendary superpower couple status. Well-fucked all-stars. Hello, Chris and Lauren, welcome. Hi, Kim. Lovely to be here. Hello. So this is um, a well-fucked couple that I would like to have share some of their experiences and practices with you. So tell me, we had this interview scheduled for today, and yet I think it interrupted something that you were doing. What was that? (laughs) Well, Chris, about three o'clock, so it's four o'clock here in England, and at about three o'clock, I went I got up to go to the toilet and then Chris suddenly said, what time is it? Or I said, what time is it? One of us said, what time is it? And we realized it was three o'clock and then we had scheduled to meet you at four o'clock. So suddenly we had to be aware of time, which- In the middle of your sex date. In the middle of our sex date, yeah. Which Chris thought was quite ironic because you were the person who introduced this concept (laughs) to our lives and we were having to cut it short. So tell me about that. How do your sex dates function? Like, do you to schedule sex or do you just naturally? Because when I have people schedule it, it's because mm. they're not naturally having enough of it, right? If people are yeah. spontaneously having enough of it, that's great. They don't have to schedule it. Although I do recommend that people carve out a certain length of time, like, for example, two to three hours where they know they're going to be uninterrupted. So how does that work for the two of you? Well, um, we don't live in the same house, and Lauren's got a little little toddler, or oh, a little boy. So we kind of we sort of plan when we're going to be together, and then that revolves around the little boy. And then when he's in bed, then we're in bed. Yeah, <laughs> that's well said. <laughs> so, how long do your sessions typically last? How long would you spend being actively in bed together? I'd say a standard amount of time is probably a couple of hours. Yeah. But then when we make a special time, it's three or four hours. But actually, we haven't. It's been probably a month since we've had a a sex date like we did today, where it's in the middle of the day and I go to the spa or something before and just get really in the zone and get really ready and get excited. And today I thought I'd try something out. I was swimming and I thought, I want to do something spicy today and I hadn't had any I hadn't got anything planned so I last minute drove around to some shops and just bought some sort of interesting food and then I blindfolded you didn't I and we got involved yeah. with some food <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun yeah I was hungry too yeah you were hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but so mostly I mean we do I you know it's that feeling of every few weeks it's nice to bring something intentional in like today Mm -hmm. we're going to focus on this Mm -hmm. whereas mostly it's pretty organic because it feels like there's a lot of spice there already but then there's always it's nice to bring things in that you think about you spend time preparing for and thinking about before because there's always patterns you can get into even when your sex life is really spicy there's always patterns you can get into where you know it's like even if you're having sex if you're intimate for a long time we could still get into a same pattern that needs to be broken up like let's just you know go really slow because sometimes we're so hungry for each other that it's hard to just slow things down Mm -hmm. and things like that well i'd say that's the hallmark of people who do keep their sex life thriving and novel over the years is that intention to do so is the intention to look at it as this thing that constantly needs nurturing and attention and and as you say like 
a bringing forth a variety that you've created. So you're thinking about how to make it different and new and unusual. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we, it's a, one of our topics of conversation. It's something that we talk about a lot. A lot. So, you've got loads of great ideas. I yeah. feel like you've got all the good ideas. I'm like tired with my son and my business. And then in the evening you're like, yeah, I was thinking on yeah. the phone, you, you've got great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I think God, I have- quite time rich. You are, but... yeah, you've got a bit more time than me. So you can sit there and conjure up fantasies. <laughs> That's wonderful. But yeah, I think it's it's um, it's really different to any relationship I've been in before, where it's just we're not just having sex; we're kind of cultivating sexiness, and 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 it's quite we we talk about whatever whatever comes into our minds, but it's it's quite a kind of it's a an ongoing conversation of which sex is a physical component of it, but we talk about it, we think about it, we laugh about it. It's kind of yeah, it's just it's just part of our relationship in quite a kind of structural way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So that you, and food. Yeah. <laughs> so you look at sex as the glue in your relationship and then you actually you make a lot of space for it and consider it to be something you need to focus on and prioritize in your lives as an essential, integral part of your connection, rather than something that's like, Oh yeah, we have sex, but it's lower down on the list of, you know, where your focus is. Yeah, exactly. I've always enjoyed having sex and all my partners in the past have always had, you know, we've always had sex, but it's been, it's totally different. It's a bit like the difference between self-pleasure and having a wank, right. you know, just sort yeah. of, it's a totally different thing. And that's been, yeah, that's part, because of, because of the work I've done with you and Lauren's sort of enthusiasms and so on it's just kind of changed the the texture of of that aspect of my life it's much I'm much more at home in it rather than yeah like you say rather than it's just something that I do at the end of the day or uh, you know it you know beginning a middle and an end it just seems to be much more sort of woven into the texture of it all now Right. And that's a beautiful way to describe it is that I often talk about, you know, I think the average person, their sex life is quite like separated out to the bedroom to a certain time frame and that's it. They've had sex versus the stuff that I'm trying to teach people about is the idea that your sexual connection is constantly flowing between you. And so it doesn't just end at the bedroom or the kitchen counter or the backseat of the car or whatever. Like there's constantly <laughs> this flow of energy between the two of you and you're and you're always looking at ways to bolster that and keep that I call it the sexual simmer, but keep that simmer flowing between you. Yeah, I agree. And it is, again, it's another thing that's sort of, it, it's, it's really, it's really fun. And it's really charged being in a relationship where I really respect and admire Lauren. And I sort of lit, you know, I, I really, she's very smart, and she's very sensitive and intelligent. And I really admire the way she goes about her business. But I also really want to fuck her. <laughs> and it's a really good it's a really good thing. So you kind of simultaneously in admiration, but also like, we just want to open her legs, you know, <laughs> it's a really cool quality. Yes, absolutely. So tell us about when you two first met, because I know that Lauren was doing her own practices of cultivating her sexual energy. So she's a great example of someone who was single and well fucked, meaning she wasn't actually having sex with other people, but she was having it with herself, but having it in such a conscious way that she was then radiating what I call the well fucked glow, like wearing her sexual energy, inhabiting it in such a way that it becomes magnetic. So tell us about when you first met and what your impressions were of her and her energy that way uh, well really really eye-catching just it's interesting I mean the context is that I'd been single for a couple of years out of choice because my I, my previous relationship to Lauren wasn't a healthy relationship it, it wasn't abusive or anything kind of profoundly negative it was just what you knew was no possible. it was just the sum it was just the sort of sum total of all the kind of lazy decisions I'd made in the past mm. and just we had sex and she was good looking and sexy and and that seemed that was I didn't I wasn't expecting anymore and I didn't get any more mm. and I realized when that finished I was just I put myself I just sort of put myself 
what's the best way of putting it? Like, yeah. Off the market sounds a weird way mm. of putting it, but I just sort of thought, I'm not, I'm not even getting involved. I'm just going to lick my wounds and just work out what I want because I'm not getting any younger and it just seems to be sort of repeated patterns in relationships and they're obviously it's obviously me because it's I'm in all those relationships <laughs> so I'd, I'd sort of um, I'd taken a couple of years to just to sort of be on my own and I, I did it I did um, I enrolled to do an MA just to keep my mind occupied and just wow. to sort of focus on doing just being just channeling yeah just energy, working out yeah. what I wanted you know I, I, yeah. I set the bar high and I decided I didn't want to make the same mistakes again and it was just it was just weird that the it was in the summer that we met in early August and I'd sort of almost come up for air about a couple of weeks before I'd I just suddenly realized that I was ready to I met someone at a festival and she kind of I, I was like, oh yeah, that's what it feels when you're attracted to someone. She, mm. she was sort of touching me a little bit. Nothing happened, but it was just, Charged. it just sparked my, I was like, oh yeah, that's what it's like. I've forgotten what it's like just to be interested in someone in that way. And then a couple of weeks later, I was with a couple of friends and we walked into this place where Lauren was working and there she was. And that was kind of it. I was mm -hmm. ready to meet not someone, but her. Oh. And yeah, we just kind of chimed straight away. You did. What I really love in hearing both of your stories is that you both took this time to really focus on yourself. And I've had that experience too, is like after, like years ago, like my last relationship where I was like, all right, I see certain patterns happening over and over again and I want to up level mm -hmm. and the same kind of thing, mm -hmm. a conscious withdrawal, as you say, taking yourself off the market without any particular end goal apart from working on yourself and up leveling yourself to get to a place where you feel shifted and transformed in a way and then you attract a higher level partner through that mm. so I really love hearing that both of you did that consciously and then manifested each other mm. it, it, it really feels like that it doesn't I, I said quite early on before I think before Lauren had introduced me to you and your work but I, I'm, I think I said something like I, th I just feel like we conjured each other up it just mm. felt like mm. I didn't have a image of the woman I wanted to be with in terms of what she looked like but I had a really clear I didn't realize how clear what she felt like to me mm -hmm. had become and Lauren mm -hmm. just completely embodied that she has exactly what I was not even looking for just I just knew that it would happen yeah it's getting to that place of knowing isn't it where you like Kim remember I said in our last interview I kept I felt like there was this mask this man energy around me all the time and I kept turning right. around because it was almost like well how is it not here you know like it's just jumping out of the walls and it's can, not even a sorry go on oh I was gonna say can you I know you've already shared that in another interview that we did but maybe you could just describe that a little bit to give some in case someone yeah. doesn't hear that other story just to describe yeah. how that was for you before you met Chris yeah, of course. So I was alluding to this feeling of, um, well, in a nutshell, I had a baby with someone and it wasn't the right relationship. And, and after, a, after a lot of work to try and leave it when it was finally, you know, the other person was finally sort of getting the message through, just really going into my cave and doing all this work and, um, and getting something that I was thinking when you were just speaking, Chris, it's like you have to get so comfortable in your loneliness and really feel so exquisitely just happy in that place. And you realize that you're not lonely anyway, but the, the loneliness is that feeling that I'm single and I'd like to be with someone. And it's this feeling of loneliness. And when that feeling itself almost becomes your partner, you nothing else you don't need anything outside but then the amazing irony is when you're really in that place like when you're not going into a big crowded place and looking around to see what member of the opposite sex is looking at you like when you're really not in that place everyone's looking at you <laughs> that's the irony of it <laughs> um so I digress. What, what, what well, you both on? cultivated this level of self-love yes. and really 
up leveling and then it was when you shifted into that next dimension that you both were vibrating at another level and then just yes. bumped like just brought each other into each other's space which is something that I talk about a lot is that <clears throat> when you're you know I've never been of the mind that you need to like really work hard to go find a partner that if yeah. you know never I've never used like dating services or online dating or anything like that and not that there's anything wrong with it per se but I've always been of the mind just that not your vibe mm. not my vibe but I've also been of the mind that when you really do your internal work and you're coming and you're really in yourself and in a wonderful place exactly people just you just find people and they find you easily like in the parking lot at the grocery store yeah. in the elevator like it just happens all the time without yeah. having to go out and try to make it happen and I think that to me that that's the barometer is when you know that you're in a really positive place, suitable people just show up and not just anyone, but people that would be contenders, you know? And yeah. so it's great people that you both you. came into it. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the funniest thing is that I was reflecting on today in the shower. Since I've been 17, I've had, I've been with partners who aren't from the UK. So there's this been this kind of thread weaving throughout my life of my, I'm not going to meet my partner in the UK or he's not going to be from the UK. So they've been, you know, people who have lived here or people I've met when I've been traveling and then they've come back here with me or whatever it is. But I'd say a string of six relationships and none of them have been English. And then <laughs> the funny thing was, and my baby's dad isn't English. And then when I actually did this work and stayed exactly where I was, the person I meet is English and I meet him exactly where I am. And I just think the metaphor in that is, and it just hit me today. I was like, wow, I was just where I am as I am. And that's where I met him in my city. Nothing particularly exotic about it, apart from it is exotic because it's our relationship. But, you know, there's nothing particularly, it's just right in front of us. It was right in front of me. Well, it is a beautiful metaphor. I agree. Like in that you know, if we think about everything as a projection, a representation of where we are in our state of consciousness, and you're bringing in all these people who are, there's a distance there, a built-in distance, right? To some degree. Yeah, oh, and interesting. And then you bring in someone who's like that close to home, where then like the capacity, there's no more excuses, there's no more running away, there's no more mm. built-in distance, you know, where your capacity for intimacy then has grown, where you're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to really show up and really be seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I remember, I, I'm, I was really clear in my head before I met Lauren that I wanted to be kept on my toes. I wanted someone, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not in the kind of you're under attack and you need to. Right. <laughs> You've done clothes, something wrong. <laughs> which is something I became boringly familiar oh, with. Babe. But, but just someone that isn't going to let you. Isn't, Hide. Is yeah, isn't just going to let you be lazy about the important things because I didn't want I didn't want to be I, I kind of I, that's not how I characterize myself but it's just mm. you want to be with someone who you you feel um excited by and not mm. anxious not anxious with at all but just kind of you want to you want to be I don't know how the best way of putting it challenged. But you, you you yeah challenge challenged. you want to you want to be you, there was there should be space to grow there should be you know oh you still Hello. there? Yeah, I oh, yeah. Doing, sorry, yeah. there was some sort of um, weird phone thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just I, I knew that I wanted to be with someone who could um, who could teach me things and inspire me to try new things and and sort of and not fossilize in what I was used to. And um, yeah, it, it's exact exactly the case is is where we are now. We're, we're kind of totally open to new things, not not just in a kind of stupid kind of questing for novelty the whole time but just <laughs> just okay. yeah open-minded i'm not everything that lauren brings to the table i'm interested in but i'm always willing i'm not not willing i'm always happy to to find out more about it and to interrogate it because i know that if if it's interested her then it will be interesting whether or not it chimes with me is a different thing but it's it's and really we've, great. we've grown so much in individually and together since getting together and I really I really now see how in my past relationships I was so guarding a part of my potential and there was this subtle feeling of being slightly almost slightly um against the other person 
it's really subtle like almost as if it's a t almost like there's sides like who's who's been working the hardest or who's who's the tiredest or who's had the most stressful week or whatever it is and and when you're doing that when you're putting a bit of your energy away you can't fully flourish together you just can't because you're you're siphoning off some of your energy so the only bit that gets through is kind of 50% of yours and 50% of mine but then the other leaky bit is pulling you down mm -hmm. but when you're both channeled it together I mean we I feel like where I am now in my business in my health is because of our relationship it's not you know it, it's entirely because of the power of our relationship that's really yeah. amazing to hear because when I talk about that place, like most people, I think, have that sort of relationship that you've just described, whereas they're a bit guarded or m m quite guarded, yet they're in a relationship and then they just subsist as though that's a normal place to be. So they've got walls up against each other. They've got places where they don't fully show up or fully communicate or fully be honest or ask for what they need and or put a certain persona forward and then they exist mm. subsist in that type of space and yet the kind of gourmet sex superpower relationship that I talk about and try to inspire people to have and show them how to have is where you've got this full honesty vulnerability expression you're letting all of yourself come into the space and so are they and then it's from that place that you can truly as you like yes you then it it charges and up levels every other part of your existence not just what you have in bed but everything else feels the benefit of that you as a in your job you as a parent you out in the world in any particular way and mm. that's to me like the proof is in the pudding like you know when you've shifted into that kind of relationship because you feel like you've unleashed this superpower yeah absolutely well said and I think as well uh, you know I think back to this isn't just about looking at people I'm looking at other people and saying why did you choose this but me in the past I chose I think you it like it has to start with choosing somebody who you really admire and really fancy it has to start with that like on an intellectual level on a physical level on a lifestyle level you're you know all of those things in the way that you would choose a friend a full sense of admiration adoration respect and also the the sexual side of it as well it has to start with that because you know i'm looking back now if it doesn't start with that then you start resenting the other person and then that's not fair on the other person. Mm -hmm. No one wants to live feeling resented, you know, so you pick someone who smokes and then you have a go at them for smoking all the time. That's not fair on them. Mm -hmm. They've been clear about who they are. And I think, you know, in the past I did little, little things like that. And, um, I think it does start, I would say to anyone who's listening, who's say, maybe single and they really want to bring in that, that person who just feels like they're, their teammate, you know, their team, their other half, although that sounds a bit kind of 50-50 postmodern, but their soulmate, you know, someone who they can go to those depths with and just really be clear with yourself when you're, when you're dating someone, like just really get into that place of intuition and self-groundedness and understanding. And then from there, the people you're going to choose are going to be a mirror of that because you're not choosing them from a place of desperation or insecurity or fear or loneliness or whatever it is, which we could all experience. But then when it starts from that, like you just, you, you sh it's not even good in life to settle for a clothing item that is the next best thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> let yeah. alone a human being. Like, you know, as someone was talking about this in my life the other day, when you, when you have options and there's the thing you'd get if you had the money, like a, an exquisite silk dress, but it costs a lot of money. And so instead of just saving up and buying it even in two years time and just just fainting in delight every time you wear it, you buy the one that you can afford because you want it now. But then every time you put it on, there's this slight feeling of, oh, it's not quite the right one. Right. <laughs> right. And you just to live like that with a human being is is a slow torture, I think. So I would say, yeah, for, for anyone who's single, just really get get into that place of just your own juiciness and, and real in your intuition. And then from there, <clears throat> the people you're going to meet, just make sure you really admire them and you would don't pick someone you would ever want to talk down to. 
you don't you, want a project. You don't want a project. You don't want to do or well said. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to buy a house that you need to renovate. <laughs> So yeah. how do you two, so you had both done your own independent work and then uh, Lauren, you had done a well-fucked woman. Was it well-fucked woman or vaginal kung fu? Both of them, Kim. But, that's right. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. And then Chris did sexual mastery for men. So then you started to have this, you both were then consciously studying and having this different language perhaps and framework for your sex life. So what are some ideas that you took from those practices that you think really helped to sustain and elevate your sex life as it is now? I think for me, definitely um, just completely changing or, uh, ch yeah, um, the sort of time scales, mm. just suddenly realizing that it can go on for hours and it do there doesn't have to be an ejaculation at the end of it. That was quite, that was quite a kind of, that was quite a seismic shift in my thinking because sex had always been, like I said before, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. It had a it it had a kind of story arc, and it always ended with um, orgasm. And that's that's a way of doing it. But the, the the what you're teaching is much more much more sort of long lasting and much more um, potent and powerful. And I, I just it just hadn't crossed my mind. That's the, it's just it's it's as simple as that. It wasn't an alien concept when it was revealed to me, but it had just never, just you, never, been obvious to me. You picked it up very quickly, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't. It wasn't like it was two minutes and done. But what no. I mean is the idea of just sort of there, there always had to be a conclusion. It felt, you know. Yeah. Whereas now, now we can sort of we sort of sometimes run out of time rather than. Run out, run of, out of energy right. or whatever. Yeah. 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 So, oh, okay. Now, or, you know, there, there's, there's a reason that it has to finish and it's not a frustrating, it's not frustrating because it hasn't reached a particular conclusion. It just, you just sort of leave it and then pick it up whenever next, whether it's conversationally or next time we're in bed together or whatever it is, this, it, it's a, it's, it's a, a thread that goes that carries on rather than a episodic thing and how did you so how did that then translate outside of the bedroom for you so you've had these different more expanded sexual experiences and then did you notice a, like how that had an influence on the rest of your life yeah i think i think you just as as a man you just feel you feel confident you if you know that your your woman is is happy with your performance i know that's a very reductive way of putting it but that's kind mm -hmm. of how certainly i would always have thought you know you want to be good in bed don't you that's the kind of phrase that everyone everyone thinks they understand and i and i've always thought i was good in bed but it's a different it was good in a different it was differently good, you know. It, this this is a whole different. This is a different realm of of. It's much more sensual, much more um, much more sexy rather than just having sex. So I just, I feel like I walked walk a little bit taller. Just feel a bit more a bit more manly. Does that... And your your health. I mean, to put it in context, since I've met you, you've just been like. So Chris is you're a you've trained since you were like before a teenager you've always worked out hard and trained and very mm. physically fit and into food and go to bed early and you lead a healthy life but since I've met you things one by one have just been dropping away and you're going oh don't think I want to drink alcohol anymore oh don't think I want to and I think there's a massive link I don't know mm. if you were going to say that but I thought I'd put that in because that's such a big... yeah I, I, I've, I've you're definitely... getting younger my love yeah, it seems that way. <laughs> but I've, I've... For quite a long time, I've had all, all the good things in my life. Like I, I have a yoga practice and so on, and, and I, I, like Lauren said, I exercise and I, I'm, I'm fit and healthy. I, I feel good about that. It never, it didn't feel like I needed to add anything else in, but I've always had sort of bad habits as well. I felt like I needed to get rid of the bad habits rather than introduce good habits. Sort of a hangover from kind of having a dissolute twenties and just lots of <laughs> friends who are 
single and, and just sort of free and easy, it's quite, there's quite a lot of bad habits that just sort of ha- hung about. And um, yeah, since being with Lauren, they just sort of they've all fallen away. I haven't had to give anything up. I've just sort of not wanted to do them anymore. And it's just been re- it's been really interesting the kind of having the our sex life as a as a kind of primal focus means that loads of other things just fall away because you can't you can't have as hard an erection if you've had half a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. That's just that's just the way it goes. And I like having half a bottle of wine, mm. but I just like having a hard erection now more or a harder. <laughs> I don't want to talk myself down. It was always it was hard. always hard. <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's a difference between uh, acceptable and Throbbing. Fuck me, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and I quite like being on the, I like, I like, I'm moving away from the acceptable. And it's just loads of things that I thought were non-negotiables have just dropped away. And that's really interesting to me because I'm 40, I'm 43. So I've, I've, it's not like I'm, I'm not, it's not my first. Time around yeah, the block. Yeah, it's not my first time around the block. Like I've, I've made plenty of mistakes and I've got plenty of sort of ingrained good habits and bad habits. But the bad ones have just just been edged out by different. Just different. My life has just been focused on on different things, and every, and the, and the, I'm waffling now, aren't I? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> you said it very well, and I think I fully agree. Like when we're nourished, and this is that I think the piece that most people just don't ever even get to is that we have so many taboos and shame around sexuality that there's not even a thought that this could become a a personal growth tool and be this substance that's energizing and rejuvenating and nourishing and then has an impact on everything else that you do that we're so nourished and I think most people are so sexually starved like they're not tapping into that as an energy source Mm, and a resource and so they have Mm. no idea they have no idea it's even possible and then on top of that they have all of these things preventing them right like oh you're a hoe if you do you know like there's all Mm. this this or a mom or whatever right there's all this baggage that's on top of it so they don't ever even get beneath that to see what's possible and then when you do and you truly get nourished like that love what i say gourmet sex right like a very satisfying multi-dimensional encounter you're so fed on so many levels that yes the things that maybe you used to go for instinctively or to fill a void or became or a past way of filling a void they just fall away and i love that Mm. because what i often see in so many parts of people's lives the changes that happen to them, they're not trying to do them. They're not trying Mm. to lose weight. They're not trying to be more confident. I am confident. I am, you know, like they're not, (laughs) that's not the journey. The journey is Mm. that they're doing this inner sexual work. They're really focusing on their sexual connection as this power source whether they're individual like single or whether they're in a relationship where the power gets amplified even more and then all of these things start to happen without them consciously trying to make them happen yeah absolutely yeah, that's definitely been my experience it really it's, it's really interesting and it, it's sort of framed as i rather than giving things up they just don't have the the temptation pull or the attraction that oh, they did yeah. have like your right. relationship with the things change because, yeah, because there's something much more nourishing, much more deeply nourishing about uh, a good relationship and great sex is much more. Why would I want to? Why would I want to compromise on that? When you when you kind of become familiar with it and start to be, and that starts to be something that you kind of expect, then why normal. would you want to? not have it Mm -hmm. yeah well that's your fueling station right like your relationship becomes your fueling station and it's like when people Mm. don't really have exercise in their life and so they decide Mm. that they're going to exercise and they've heard of all these benefits of it like intellectually 
but they haven't really experienced it. And so still they, got to run and it hurts. Right, they go for a run and they have to force themselves to go for a run. And the first 20 minutes are hell. But then after 20 minutes or so, their endorphins kick in, their, their neurotransmitters start to shift a little bit and they're like, oh, this is, this is actually kind of good. And then they have to, for the next few weeks, they say committed to this new exercise regime, but they have to force themselves out the door. They're like, all right, I said I would work out today. Oh, I'm going to go do it. But then something amazing happens is like after three weeks, the brain and the body have shifted. There's these new neural pathways that have been created Mm -hmm. and they understand this is something that's good for us on every level. And then the brain and the body are like, hey, are you where when are we going to exercise today don't you have to work out like let's go let's yeah, get out that door this. come on right right we need to get fed get us out there and yeah. you're like and then it becomes it has a life of its own because your body and your brain are on board now they know they know and they're going to hold you to it and i feel like that same thing happens with people sexually is that they don't know what they don't know what they've never experienced and then they start mm. to get glimpses of it and then they're yeah, they start, like you're saying, like you're having these regular sexual encounters without having to necessarily schedule them. The only thing you might do is make sure that you've carved out some time logistically, right? Like where you've got mm. time away from a child or time that you're both not focused, don't have other commitments, like that's the scheduling part, but that you would naturally be having it, but scheduling it more specific, larger chunks I mean, we do, just to say, like it is, it is an effort in the sense that we we kind of we often think well if we want to have some time in bed then we have to and we have to eat and we don't like eating late so it does it definitely takes a bit of creative thinking doesn't it Mm. we don't just go with the flow we Mm. sort of say yeah but we'll just we will have just eaten dinner then so we're not going to have much time we don't want to make love on a full stomach so we're definitely we're thinking ahead Mm. a few days in advance and sort of planning when we'll eat and you know all that kind of stuff it's a bit more fun in a relationship because it's not there's never that feeling of effort I feel with sex that there is with exercise in that it does exercise actually does hurt you know like hit training or something like that sometimes I really have to force myself and it's I always do but sometimes it's like oh come on then but with giving you a blowjob or something I never have to convince myself to do it but I can imagine if someone was in that situation and it's not a judgment it's easy to get into that if you haven't been paying attention to to your relationship and you kind of resent your partner and then you don't want to give them a blowjob or something um i would say if you know they're the right person for you and you love them then just don't listen to that voice and just go for it and just tell that voice to shut up because really it's your relationship or it's your feeling of oh i'm a bit annoyed with them i don't want to give them a blowjob (laughs) and what do you want more (laughs) so yeah sometimes you have to just do what you know is right if if that's the situation as well Right. And I think there's a difference between people being quite estranged, like having a lot of internal clearing work to do before they can get to that place where the sexual energy is flowing versus just kind of making excuses like it's late or it's I'm too tired or, you know, we have to be vigilant in the same way. Right. Because people do that exactly what you're saying about exercise, like you're you're already living in more of a simmer. And so there's more of that natural pull. But when people drop below that, as you see, yeah. the build up of stuff that's unresolved between them. Um, then all of the other excuses become really weighty like oh it's yes. nighttime oh i'm tired oh but oh but you know this tv show is on like whatever right yeah. where they start yeah. to default to that so what would you two say like what are the top three things that you say you do to really nurture your sexual connection well the the first thing that i realized yes that I said yesterday and I mentioned it to you didn't I was I think the the biggest thing is that we're not each other's therapist and I know that's not a direct answer to your question but I never feel like Chris is coming to me as if I'm his therapist I mean we share we've got we're very open we're very vulnerable everything's completely open energetically but I never get the feeling from him that he's in a bad way and I need to sort of help him unravel things and um, I can come to him and I can burst into tears and I can cry, but it's never this feeling that I need him to be my therapist. And what I mean by that is just the we, we don't put that weight on each other, but obviously some obviously there's all kinds of ways that we support each other. So I'd say that's the biggest thing for keeping a simmer. 
on a psychological level yeah being being kind of competent in our own lives mm. so you kind of you're not there's no sort of damsel in distress requirement at any given time <laughs> it's you don't i don't i don't ever feel like I, my previous relationships that there's always it always feels like a bit of a net drain for both parties somehow <laughs> you know like but whereas this it seems like it seems like we're both putting in 100% and getting out and getting out more it's like a kind of perpetual energy machine. Hmm. So what do you think we do to keep the... Was it to um, keep the simmer alive, Kim, that you said? Well, was that your question? Um, sure, that's another... I said to nurture your sexual connection, but keep and the simmer uh, alive I is think, really the same The same idea. I think the... Com- just we... It's, all, it's, it's always an aspect of our conversation. We talk about other things, but I think we, talk, we probably talk about... And admittedly, we're not, we don't live together, so there are certain kind of mundane... Um, conversations that aren't yet uh relevant right. like you know who's yeah. the, the gas supplier or whatever that that's not currently relevant but although we will be living together soonish so there's so i guess we're lucky that there's a certain amount of um uh mystery that's still there. yeah the, yeah yeah there's a certain like when lauren was coming lauren was coming to me for midday today so i just i just made sure the house i mean the house is always nice but i just put some candles on put you know so there was some nice smell in the room that there was you know it, it just you it was a, yeah it was welcome it was f it was a nice place to come into and that's um that's something that we we can we because we make a point of um the, we make things special for each other mm-hmm. no lauren would not that you lauren wouldn't be upset if i hadn't made the effort but you don't yet know what it's like to come into my house without <laughs> me having no. made an effort because my body just I always relaxes because I come in here and I see everything that you've done. I kind of go, mm. but yeah, I, th- I think just it's just it's not um, it's not a moot point. Like we we talk about we talk about sex. We talk about um, oh, yeah, it's just part of the conversation. Yeah, and that's important because it's just because it means you can you you don't have to start talking about things when you should be getting intimate. The conversation's happening all the time and then so the intimacy say, is part of that when you say you're talking about orgasms for example like how does that what what are you talking about well like sometimes we i really love it when we drive together because i'm often driving around with monty and so, well, if three of us go on a little trip somewhere on the weekend and we just get to sit in the car for a few hours and we can just talk and i love that because we don't often get that much time and i'll just say yeah so this was you know I'm I the anal and I've realized I can have an anal orgasm and it's blowing my mind and then we'll just talk about that because sometimes in in the bedroom we we don't remember or there's just it's too intense it's not necessarily well, about you're not in your rash- mind to, to analyze yeah, at the you're same not time as having the experience yeah, yeah. you're in your I mean, even after sometimes <laughs> you just go yeah exactly you're, you're, you just can't think about anything so sometimes it'll be days later and I'll go yeah wow the other you know when I've come back down to earth a little bit or come back into my head a little bit um and then he'll you'll tell me your experience about what it was like for you if it was something that happened in my body you tell me mm. what it was like to be part of that and that is when we sometimes I'll um I'll call Lauren and she won't answer because she's self-pleasuring <laughs> and then so and then you know an hour later I'll get uh, oh I, I couldn't talk cause I, and that's like there's I'll no sort of I'll send you a photo though yeah, but there's no sort of it's not like oh for fuck's sake why didn't you answer the phone or, or um, there's no frustration I just like uh, that's what Lauren wants to do that's cool with me you know <laughs> and it's, it's good for everyone yeah, it's good for everyone so, so it's just so it just becomes part of every conversation oh, you know like oh I couldn't answer the phone because this or because I was self-pleasuring or, or whatever it might be it's just it's just a kind of, yeah, it's what we talk about. Yeah. So tell me about these anal orgasms, if you'd like. You don't have to if you don't want yeah. to. Yeah. So it, it was a huge, huge, mind-blowing revelation for me um, to realize that I could have an orgasm through from anal sex. And, I mean, and then when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, of course, because you know the the anus isn't gender specific and gay people have been having a gay men have known this for thousands and thousands of years and gay men's bum holes aren't any different to straight women's bum holes so there must All be something in this yeah 
Sorry, in terms of nerve full endings. Full of nerve endings, yeah. Full of nerve endings, yeah. Yeah, so it was a real revelation to me. And I kind of feel like, in a sense, I lost my virginity to you in that way. I mean, I'd had anal sex experiences before, but they hadn't. I hadn't really understood about letting go on that deep mm. energetic level. So I just, yeah, so it, it wasn't, it was painful, basically, and I endured it, you know. But I, I knew that there was something some place deeper to go so I hadn't written off completely I hadn't written anything I wouldn't write anything off completely I just knew that tensing (laughs) and trying to experience pleasure is not going to go hand in hand and then we've been exploring it since the early days haven't we Mm. it's a special occasion thing yeah um and it's just completely transcendental it's just it just blows my mind um but then, obviously, because on you're not being penetrated, so for you, I'm always interested how it's different for you. And then when we talk about it a few days later, I just love I just love talking about sexual experiences we've had. I love reflecting on them, and it kind of brings it all back up, doesn't it? Mm. It turns us on again. <laughs> yeah, it's probably worth saying as well, if it's not immediately obvious, that Lauren talks about sex quite a lot anyway. So with friends. Yeah, but and... we're in a sexual. <laughs> yeah. <we're> at... <laughs> yeah, but it's not. I, I, I've never. I, part of the reason that we talk about sex so much is because Lauren is quite comfortable talking about sex anyway. Yeah. So it would, it would be natural that we do. But that, but it's kind of freeing to have that as part of our relationship because it means that things just get get spoken about. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think that that's that's, a, that's probably the biggest thing. It's, it's the just having it always around Mm. so it's there's a constant openness about it there's no taboo or judgment and there's a freedom to just express and say or do whatever yeah it's not like like, sex doesn't live in the bedroom Mm. it's not like we get sex out every time we go to the bedroom it's it's just sort of it it pervades (laughs) our our kind of life together yeah and and like I was saying, Kim, to you in our last interview, I want I want my little boy to grow up with with his feet with a feeling of his mum being happy and fulfilled and sensual and you know a healthy sexuality to be really normalised and people to come around to our house and see that example because I did not grow up with that. I mean, I grew up with the kind of conventional parents working hard with a nice house, never really kissed, you know great people individually but didn't have that much um active affection towards each other and most of my friends parents it was the same and i remember if there was if there was someone's parents who were, would kind of grab each other's asses and kiss each other and stuff we'd all be going yeah their parents are really kinky you know it was <laughs> as if it was this kind of crazy thing that their parents did that and relatively so, speaking, it is because most people yeah. are just hiding all of that energy from their kids. And if they're even experiencing it, if they're even experiencing it. Yeah. I mean, mm. if they're hiding it, great. At least they've got it. Yeah. On some right. Level. <laughs> all right. So to yeah. summarize that, like you would say, you're not using each other as as therapists and you've got your own kind of emotional, energetic, psychological support. You come to each other as whole people. You're yeah. doing your own work and then we do we both do a lot of self yeah we look after ourselves a lot yeah yeah and then you have a very open forum for talking about sex outside of the bedroom so that you can express and debrief and mm-hmm. you know re-experience yep fantasize yeah yeah and what else God, I, I think um I, I guess it's part of the previous two is that but we're, we're uh, you know, some, sometimes people get into a relationship and that's when they give up. Yeah. So they kind of, they stop going to the gym or they don't, they're not quite <laughs> as assiduous in their self care. They don't really, you know, they, 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 they become, you see, I see it so many times people get married and then stop giving a shit about how they look. And you yeah. think, well, that's not, that's not what it's about, but we're, I'm, we're, we're both doing everything we can to be objectively, as attractive as possible and that sounds on an energetic level yeah yeah, but like we we ex i don't know do do all the things do all the things that you do in order to attract someone you carry on doing it so we want to fuck ourselves yeah 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 right yeah don't don't just sort of take it for granted 
it, it, and we, I'm very, very, very grateful for what my my life currently is. It's not not every aspect of my life is exactly how I want it, but it feels more and more like that's a possibility, and that's really exciting. So, what do you think the difference is like between someone who do, does let all that stuff go, so they stop focusing on their parents, they stop prioritizing the relationship, versus people like yourself, say, who are making more effort. And I see that same common thread in people who do sustain lifelong passion, you know, decades worth of really hot sex, is they're simply making the effort. But what do you think switches off? Like, because most people mm. talk about how they, at the beginning of the relationship, there was lots of sex, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'm just curious what you guys mm. think, you know, what happens? What's the difference between a couple who loses it and a couple who keeps mm. it? Well, what I'm going to say might sound a bit tangential, but I, the way I see the world is through the lens of art just is the influence of everything I do. And I think it's this concept of the muse. You know, there is if you're an artist and by that, I mean someone who is just working really hard to bring about your vision in any material from paint to boardroom design, whatever it is. If you're an artist, you know that once you reached um, an aspect of your vision, you still have to work. You have to work even harder the more things come to materialize. So I think with it's the same in a relationship. The muse is there as long as you're open to receive it. And that consistency of being open to receive it is going to increase you meeting the muse. So if you if you work hard and then you execute a piece of work and then you go, oh, okay, great, I can put my paints away, I can stop getting up early, I can stop going for inspiring walks, all the rest of it, then you're just going to dwindle because you're looking at this painting as the epitome of your achievement rather than the paintings just part of a process which just is this mm -hmm. ongoing unfolding of the development of you as an artist. And you might look back in three years at that painting and go, God, I mean, I'm happy I did it, but it's I've moved on so much. I've I've improved how I can paint. I've improved my work. And I think it's the same in a relationship. You either see it as, oh, well, I've, you know, I've, I've got the relationship now, so I don't have to do anything else. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. the whole thing expands to you. The whole thing becomes, it's a person and a di it's, it's this dimension that opens up that the more you put in, the more you get out and the more subtle it becomes. Um, yeah, I, th I agree. I agree. I'm, I, it's kind of the story you tell yourself, isn't it? Like if, if you have this kind of declensionist, this kind of idea that over time things necessarily get worse, that you're necessarily more feeble at 50 than you were at 40, mm -hmm. then you kind of, <laughs> you it's, it's kind of understood that the beginning of a relationship is the best bit you know, the honeymoon period yeah. and everyone just yeah. sort of understands that, okay, well, you know, well, it's so of course we don't have sex. Well. We've been married for five years, that kind of thing. <laughs> like what, what, what are you talking about? And I just think I, I've never really, I've never really bought into that way of thinking. Like I do, I do just think that tomorrow can and why not, you know, can and should be better than today. And Maybe that's just, it's just, a, it's not it's a subtle difference. It's quite, it's quite a significant difference, but I don't, I don't look to my future self and think that I will, that I will be a kind of shadow of the person I am now. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to being that future self and I, I imagine he will be more rather than less. Mm. So I guess I naturally think the same it? about the relationship. I, I think that, I think that, it's a it's a living breathing uh entity and we're feeding all our energy and our love and our joy into it so it it makes sense that it become more rather than less over time but i think some people they they settle don't they they just settle for they settle down that's that's the term people use or they settle right. for someone and they ju they yeah, just kind of down. that's that that's the metaphor that's the story they're living through and they kind Settle of down. That's such yeah it's just it's it's maybe it's easier and i use i'm not i don't mean I, like in inverted commas maybe it's easier just to settle for someone and just to kind of 
I don't know, let entropy do its work. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm not really up for that. I don't. I. I don't know. I don't really fancy it. I, I'm. I'm quite. I quite. I like the fact that I'm virile in my mid forties because. What the fuck? What's the alternative? <laughs> I, well. I don't. I don't really like the. I don't really like the sound of the alternative. So yeah. I'll do everything I can to be. You know, I know people that aren't much older than me. I know. I know people who are younger than me that are like buying Viagra and things mm-hmm. like that. Well, and I'm not. I'm not. I guess I am being judgmental, but it's not. It's not necessary if you're. It, you make make other decisions. You know. I was chatting to a yeah. friend the other day, and and he was talking about sexual performance and I, and I didn't want to get too sort of cosmic you on didn't him want to because... brag too much <laughs> <laughs> no no I, I know I really did want to brag but I was um but I didn't um but I thought rather than getting all cosmic I was just just like don't have don't have four pints of beer before you get into bed don't don't mm. get stoned like just if it, if you're if you're in your 40s and you're going to bed with someone you've been going to bed with for the last three or four or five years and you're both drunk and you're both stoned i I mean what what are you i don't know what are you expecting to happen (laughs) do you know what i mean (laughs) bottle of lube a few pills of viagra and a a three minute sexual experience that's what the expectation it it comes down to confidence doesn't it because you know to in the in the same way that like to, to run and to look after your body comes down to confidence to run out in the morning when everyone's on their way to work in their suits and you're running out in your workout clothes and you're sweating and you've got a funny face on and you're doing this quite odd thing really it takes confidence and I think it's the same with with like sometimes when we do things in the bedroom I can feel myself there's a part of me that wants to shy away like recently when I did that little dance for you when we were in Venice <laughs> you know there was a part of my mind that yeah. was like oh I could just not do this mm. you know because it's actually a, a little bit on the edge I mean it's I'm, I'm not I haven't those had heels any, were high as well, those heels they? were high <laughs> <laughs> And it's about coming out of your comfort zone. I could have easily just, we could have had a beautiful lovemaking experience that didn't include the dance and didn't include the mm. thing, that the sort of game that we we're playing. But we did. We came out of our box a little bit and, and came out of our comfort zone. And just like going onto stage, you have to do that. Or yeah. going on camera, you have to do that. You know, as Kim, I'm sure, you know, you're used to a lot. You just have to keep upping that level of what you do to challenge yourself. Yes. But you have to take that plunge. And um, and that's why I get really inspired talking to friends of mine who are in, I wouldn't say ruts, but who, you know, as Chris said, I like to talk about sex. I love talking about relationships. And so often now, especially men, I think because I'm quite open, friends of mine, and even like where we go to just the spa that we go to for sauna and steam, people will just start telling me their relationship kind of mm. challenges because um, I like to think that I'm a non-threatening kind of voice and I'll just be really sympathetic but I'll just say things like well have you thought about you know booking her a massage or giving her a massage and just like straight in with a suggestion of something they could implement tonight and they'll often just their mind will look blown that it could be that simple Mm -hmm. and I think um I think it inspires me how workable things actually are whatever the situation is in your relationship if you both if you both respect each other and you know you want to be together yeah it takes a bit of work but you can transform it if you're actually with someone who you know you shouldn't be with then the time to leave them is yesterday you know yeah. <laughs> that's a different story but I find it really inspiring how with these little tweaks that you can make it's just like getting fit you could be 25 stone and sitting on a sofa but you can change your life you, it just starts with the choices you make today and I think sensual fitness and relationship fitness is the same. It's just you keep going out of your comfort zone a little bit. And then you come back into this incredible zone of comfort and love and intimacy. And But you have to kind of dance in and out of it. 
Um, well, I think I think you bring up yeah. a really good point about the confidence and getting out of your comfort zone because I feel like in my life and even in my work, for me to feel like I'm growing and challenging myself, I need to do things that are slightly different and new that I have to yeah. figure out. That I have to even starting a podcast, it's like all right, I'm going to do that because that's different yeah. and new and putting myself into a whole other skill set and way of operating. Because once you have you to feel show like, up, don't you? Yeah, right. You have to show up and call on parts of yourself to do that so I think I think confidence is a huge piece and overall self-responsibility like mm. you know making the decision and knowing that you're the one who can change things rather than accepting a certain fate or a certain story even though it's a very popular story like the story that oh after a couple of years relationships just naturally fizzle out well, it's not the case. It's that after a couple of years, people start to put their attention elsewhere and the relationship elsewhere. starts to reflect that, right? It starts to reflect yeah. mm. this death. or And having a priority of growing. Like just it's a combination, then I'd say, of the self-responsibility and confidence is um, like having it as an actual value to evolve and to grow and to keep reaching that next level rather than, yeah. you know, it's either grow or die. You're either growing or you're decaying. It's nothing yeah. that's really in between. Nothing if... really stays still in the natural world. Exactly. You know, it might look like it does, but yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think for, for me, certainly in, in previous relationships, maybe, maybe a while ago now when I was quite a bit younger, it, my, my kind of catchphrase was, I, wa I was going to do that. I was going to, like whether it was, <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, oh, yeah, I, oh, I didn't clean it. I know I was going to do it. It, it was like, it, was, it must have been really tedious to be with me because it was pretty tedious being me, but it was just this kind of, I was going to, it, it was, yeah, just sort of, it's not that you didn't notice the things that needed doing. Yeah. It's just that you were able to. It's action, isn't it? just yeah. able to convince yourself that you could get away with not doing it. Yeah. Whereas now it's the total opposite. Like I, I feel like, I feel like if something needs doing, it's done. I've just done it. It's already done. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and if, You're very good like if, that. if I notice something, I don't know, go over to Lauren's house and notice something. I don't think, I don't think, Oh look, the bin needs taking out. Never mind. I'm, I'm on my way in a minute. Uh, Lauren can do it. I don't think I don't, it's just that the bins just I just put it out, you know, like all the mundane things that don't add up to much individually. But it's the mentality that you bring to it. You think, oh, that, that, if I do that now, which will take me about 20 seconds and about three calories, I can do that now and I'll feel good about doing it. And it means that Lauren won't have to do it. I love that. And you've just things. added like a tit more lubrication to Lauren's vagina. Yeah, exactly, totally. exactly. And it's not like, oh, look at me, look what I'm doing. Hello, everybody. Look what, look at the good thing I'm doing. It's just <laughs> you just do it. You just do it. Whereas before, I'd either be not before <clears throat> this, but like you know, in my twenties, I would either be not doing it and and excusing myself for not doing it and like tie myself up into knots why it didn't get done, or I would just. Yeah, just just couldn't be bothered, and it's just it's just different. Like you get you become an adult, and you and you start taking responsibility for yourself, and then at somewhere along the line, the relationship that you're in becomes the most important thing, because it's not that you you not that you give everything to the relationship and have nothing left for yourself. It's like the more you give to the relationship, the more time and space you have for your own development. It's a really weird kind of mathematics I don't know how it works but you kind of you give more and more and more and you have more and more to give and you you don't end up getting you don't end up being sort of henpecked or bullied or nagged because you've done all the things and it hasn't taken you it hasn't hasn't been a hassle to do but they're done you're being the person you want you want to you're being the person you want to be yeah yeah totally and it's just it just makes you feel kind of quietly proud of the person you are yeah. which is not a very English thing to say but oh, yeah that's why I love you baby <laughs> yeah, yeah and I'm Welsh but anyway yeah yeah it's, it's yeah it's just it, it makes me I feel I feel much much more I feel like I inhabit myself and the planet much more honestly than than ever before hmm. and I think that's part part to do with getting older but it's also just because the decisions you make and prioritizing a good relationship and then within that 
um, framework, not not just thinking, oh, I've got it now, and yeah. resting. Yeah. Just like I say, yeah. keep being kept on my toes. That's the whole. That's what I wanted. You don't, I don't want to be unchallenged by life. And I know, I, we, I know that if I were to be um, get a bit lazy about things, and I don't mean I don't mean like exercise wise. I just mean. You mean again, let's it, watch Netflix? Yeah, cl- <laughs> well, yeah cl- no, j- or just sort of t- turning the other way when things need to be done, just sort of not quite, not quite being there. Then mm. I'd, I'd really notice that now. It would be really alien to me. Yeah, it makes me feel like I'm being a better person. I love what you said about the strange mathematics, like the equation of mm. giving, yeah. like giving to being in integrity in yourself and then being in integrity and giving to the relationship. And it is, I think it's this energy amplification that takes place Mm. when you're living that way and you end up being able to accomplish much more, you're in a flow. I think there's something about that self-honesty and then being synced up in your relationship that elevates your whole production. Like the, you know, your Mm. output, your flow, your opportunities magnetizing themselves to you, your ability to get things done in a much more efficient way that doesn't tire you out. Like all of these things are byproducts. And I think both of what you said, Mm. like on an individual level, your integrity and how you conduct yourself in your own life and your world overall, and then how you do that in your relationship. And if you're really building the energy that you put into building a gourmet sex connection, having that as something that really feeds you it feeds you tenfold you know like you put in this much energy but it gives back 10 times the amount Mm. Mm. yeah i agree i agree wonderful well is there anything Mm. else that you'd like to throw into the mix before we wrap up thank you thank you yeah i just feel so grateful to have these well on a practical level to have these tools and i think to feel grateful for the love in your life is just the most I feel so wealthy for having a good relationship and then it's just this snowballing effect so I feel really grateful and I love that I found you and that we found you and that you're what you teach is a part of our relationship because more people need these tools for sure so yeah I just feel really grateful and there's always more to learn and there's always more to uncover and it's bloody marvelous to be here Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're both such a wonderful example of people doing the work to consciously build and empower their relationship. Yeah, it's amazing work. Thank you, Kim. And best of luck with this wonderful podcast. I love all your episodes. Thank you. Yeah, keep up the good work. If you want to learn how to create a conscious relationship where you unleash your superpowers both as individuals and as a couple, check out my Coming Together for Couples Salon. In this 10-week online program, we cover everything from communication skills and all the steps to move a relationship from the unconscious default realm to the transcendent superpower couple place of which I speak. With a few essential skills thrown in along the way, like learning to have full body orgasms, separating orgasm from ejaculation for men, vaginal orgasms for women, how to amplify masculine and feminine energies in your relationship and explode your chemistry, and how to use your sexual connection to build this incredible immunity to everything in your life. Essentially, how to perfect the holy fuck. Come one, come all. Coming Together is now open for registration and you can sign up at kimanami.com under Sexual Savant Salons and look for Coming Together. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe and also leave a review and send someone else the gift of a healthy libido and an off the charts love life by sharing this episode with them. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, many happy orgasms.